and um, mahalo uh, Chief Oliveira, Civil Defense for being here and your staff as well um, to give us that update and uh, I'm sure council members have a lot of questions but um, really wanted to get an update from you folks about what's been happening in the last several months so thank you so throughout this update you know I might turn to Aaron to maybe delegate which one of his team from the department to answer any questions you may have regarding the update uh, just where we're at currently I think everybody's been following our messages as of uh, yesterday still 200 cases 200 sorry 260 cases confirmed and holding we haven't seen any new additional cases since last Thursday looking very promising and the the cautious uh, message I'd put out there we're not over yet you know the, the most recent date of onset of illness was February 13th so we're still not out of the woods and can't say that this is over at this time yet uh, but with each day passing with no additional cases it's looking more and more promising things that are contributing to the success with the outbreak and maybe the, the downturn are several things first and foremost it's the public's support and participation in the fight the bite campaign we know that through a, a, a very um, uh, early survey that DOH has been working on uh, a preliminary survey they're refining it and that's with Jason and his team but uh, as they've been talking to people in the public we know that about 60 percent of the respondents to the survey have indicated they've changed their behavioral practices with using repellent wearing covered clothing modifying their activities and behaviors in an effort to prevent getting being bitten so again a lot of credit goes to the community with what they're doing as well as taking steps to clean up breeding areas around the homes and businesses so first and foremost I want to say thank you to the community for what they've been doing to participate and support the fight the bite campaign and address the, the issues that they can uh, around their homes next is the aggressive um, response we've had from the vector control team you know the Department of Health from the very onset uh, when we partnered up on November 4th and initiated the response to the outbreak set some uh, very aggressive uh, schedules if you want to call our objectives with doing the vector control operations which means when as soon as the vector control office is notified of a suspect or confirmed case the plan was to treat those properties uh, residents primarily within 96 hours of notification and the vector control team has consistently uh, exceeded the expectations they've been spraying or treating properties within 24 to 48 hours consistently they're able to do that even with the, the periods where we saw significant numbers of properties that needed to be treated due to support from the county uh, you know the mayor was very generous in committing county resources to buy uh, sprayers as well as to commit county personnel from public works and parks and rec to be trained to supplement and complement the vector control team so what you see happening out there what you've seen happening is a partnership between the county and state to build capacity to go out and spray these properties in a timely manner um, I really appreciate Dr. Horwitz's comments about the impact with the environment and what we need to think about when we take strategies because it raises to the surface a couple of things with the spraying that the uh, vector control teams have been doing it hasn't been blanket uh, broad fumigation if you want to call it or fogging it's been very precise surgical and, and strategic based on where they see the breeding areas but we're also very sensitive and appreciative to what kind of impacts you could have with the chemical pesticides or adulticides that are used the aqua resin product that has been used from the start was identified as a very safe and effective adulticide but it could have uh, adverse consequences it's just as effective on uh, killing bees so going forward as we look at you know maybe long-term mosquito control strategies it would benefit from considering all of the potential impacts of whatever we're going to do we've received numerous requests from the public to consider broad aerial spraying of, of adulticide similar to what other states do and again with the response we provided to uh, those recommendations or suggestions and questions is that presently we're responding in a very strategic manner based on the outbreaks so we're treating or trying to knock down infected mosquitoes that are likely to be in the presence around the the cases that are confirmed or suspect so that's where the resources have been focused but when we talk about long-term mosquito control there really needs to be some good discussion 
and uh, research on what is appropriate and consider the potential environmental impacts if we were to look at something like aerial spraying. As I mentioned, the impact on just the bee population, the agricultural community would be significant. The other part that we're sensitive to is for organic farmers out there, we don't want to jeopardize their certification as organic farms. So we've been working closely with the Department of Ag and Department of Health to identify alternative products that would not in any way compromise an organic farmer's certification. And we've identified uh, a few products. And we're very grateful that you know Chris Jacobson, the entomologist, is a new addition also as part of this outbreak. Uh, with the response and the uh, support of the governor's office, funding an entomologist position on the Big Island. Chris was picked up two Wednesdays ago, has been out there since, and has already provided so much benefit to the response with his expertise. He was a, a former entomologist with Department of Health, and unfortunately with the reorg that they went through years ago, um, he was one of the, the individuals affected by that reorg. But we were very fortunate that he remained a resident, was committed and offered to come back. And fortunately, with the funding made available, he's back on staff. And he is based here on the Big Island providing entomology support for the response. But he's provided great insight based on his experience with mosquitoes on what would be uh, future strategies for maintenance uh, around certain properties with controlling the adults, as well as in providing information on how we can adjust our strategies with source reduction and, and larvicides, et cetera. So going back to Vector again, they've maintained a very aggressive uh, response to the cases. Uh, if you want, Eric can provide you the exact numbers of how many properties they've sprayed. It's in excess of 300 properties uh, since the beginning of the onset. The strategy that they use is they'll go out and spray the suspect or com uh, confirmed case property with consent from the property owner. They'll also approach neighboring properties and try to get consent and treat those adjacent properties as well, out to at least 25 yards, and they repeat that spray within a week. We found that strategy to be very effective in knocking down adult mosquitoes. Uh, in other areas, we, such as Mililii and other communities, we've added additional treatment strategies to include the trapping that you heard uh, the people from Pahoa mentioning. We found some effectiveness there. Uh, one of the big issues that we have with source reduction is the water catchment tanks. Uh, I think all of us on the Big Island appreciate that we have such a large number and uh, population base that depends on water catchment as their only source of water for potable use. And that has been uh, one of the primary, if not in some areas, the breeding space or the breeding environment for mosquitoes. Uh, we've been working to identify products that can be applied to catchment tanks that would still allow the water to be potable and safe for use, uh, but to uh, reduce the propagation of mosquitoes, eliminate larvae, um, and maintain that. Uh, as you heard uh, the gentleman from Paul mention, you know, there has been in the past treatment of standing water with oils. And we found that there's some products out there, neem oil being one of them, that has shown some benefit. But there's always that question of is it still, uh, the water still safe for potable use? So we've been identifying products that um, we'd like to test and evaluate and get confirmation that would be safe to recommend for residents to use, make sure it's available over the counter. Um, and that it would be reasonable as far as the application to treat catchment tanks. In the meantime, the recommendation has been to treat your catchment tank with a chlorine bleach solution. We found that to be effective in reducing uh, the presence of larvae in the tank. Uh, it does require you know, re retreatment or uh, periodic retreatments. And the percentage or the concentration there is one third cup of bleach per thousand gallons in your tank. So the next area we have been, uh, or um, branch of our operations is the public education branch. As I mentioned, Jason is our uh, public education branch um, director for the operations. Recently, there's been an expansion of the outreach. Uh, two, in, two Wednesdays ago, uh, beginning on February 17th, uh, representatives from Department of Health, Civil Defense, our CERT teams, they went out in the Kailua Kona area because we see a, um, an area of Kailua Kona as being a, a higher than high hotspot with some associated cases. And we wanted to make sure that the information that businesses had in that area, residents had in the area was what they could use to make sure that they were better aware of the problem and could protect themselves. So they went door to door in the area from uh, on Lee Drive from the Royal Kona Resort all the way out to Kona Commons where the 
um, sports authority complex is at. Again, on the foot, on the ground, door to door, making contact with businesses and residents in that area, and informing them that we've seen cases associated with that general area, and sharing with them what they can do to protect themselves, providing sample repellents for some of the businesses who have employees that work outdoors, as well as to help identify in partnership with Vector and Entomology any problem issues with breeding grounds. You know, it's providing simple guidance to property owners that if you have an air conditioning unit, it's likely dripping water and collecting outside with a drain. Just that amount of water can present a breeding ground for mosquitoes. If you're irrigating your property, we're in a drought right now, many properties are being irrigated as a means of keeping the vegetation alive and that's presenting with breeding grounds. And then obviously cleaning up any kind of refuge that pr provides the opportunity for a breeding source. We also have had, since the beginning, risk reduction teams that, as our office receives concerns or complaints from the community about standing water, about abandoned vehicles, abandoned tires, we've been sending these teams out, again, primarily civil defense staff, along with our community emergency response team or CERT personnel, going out and investigating, verifying, and if possible, mitigating some of these complaints. We've identified some very unique issues out there in the environment, to give you examples. Um, day before yesterday, our risk reduction team went out to a property in Ocean View in which they confirmed, and again, this was information volunteered by the property owner. He has over a thousand tires on his property uh, that's gonna need to be relocated and, and removed. Unfortunately, he's not physically able or, or have the resources to get it. So we're looking at ways to, in the very near future, pursue a community-wide cleanup, and for some of these very unique situations is reach out for assistance, such as the National Guard and other resources to do a one-time, let's get some of these problems addressed, get them out of the, the community, and prevent the future uh, problems from occurring. Because even if we get through this outbreak, there's always the potential for another one. What this outbreak has done is raise everybody's awareness of how vulnerable we are that these things can be at any time introduced into our community. We all know that you know dengue is not endemic to our island. It was brought in by a traveler, whether that was a returning resident or someone passing through, but that's how it got here. So we're always at risk for these diseases coming into our community. And if we can do things to uh, address the, the other problems out there that will add to the risk, such as stockpile of tires and abandoned vehicles and other things, we can hopefully minimize uh, the outbreak from occurring in the future. And as I mentioned, we were very fortunate to have Chris on board as an on-island entomologist with tremendous amount of knowledge and experience to help guide some of our strategies, not only for this response, but as you heard uh, conversations about trapping, uh, as you heard Dr. Horowitz with, you know, uh, I guess more appropriate mosquito treatment measures going forward, um, the value of having an entomologist available to guide that decision making and provide the expertise on what would be effective uh, is invaluable. So again, we're very gr grateful for that. I think at this point I'd like to just open it up if you have any questions from myself or any of the other team members that we have here this morning. Um, model Chief, um